Psalm chapter 1. We're just going to read the whole psalm. It's a short psalm, and then we'll, we'll go through and break it down. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So once again, I titled this morning's message, Counsel from God. It was a simple enough title, but that's essentially the idea that we're going to be talking about this morning. Um, and Psalm 1 is considered what you would call a wisdom psalm. Uh, the concept of wisdom is prevalent throughout the Old Testament. Um, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2, if you put that verse of Scripture up, that's a good, the Proverbs are filled with the terminology or the word wisdom. And this is Solomon. This is actually the first proverb, as you can see. Um, the first verse of, the, of this particular chapter actually just describes that the Proverbs were written by Solomon. And this is what Solomon said about wisdom. He said, to know wisdom, instruction to perceive the words of understanding. The very word know there has the idea of not just friendship, but kinsmanship. Um, and there's times in the, in the Proverbs where the word wisdom is is personified. Okay, what does personification mean? In case we've got any young people in here, personification is when you give lifelike qualities to inanimate objects. For instance, you could say, the wind howled like a wolf as it ripped through the canyon. Okay, you gave life, you made wind like a wolf. And you made something that was inanimate and didn't have life to seem like it had life, to seem like it had human like qualities. Wisdom is repeatedly personified in the Proverbs and is described sometimes, let, let her be your kinswoman, let her be your sister, as though she was a human being or wisdom in itself was a human being that you could get to know, okay? And, and, and actually there are times within, within the Old Testament or even in Proverbs that it appears that if you look real closely, especially in Proverbs chapter 8, that wisdom is, is really related to the revelation that we have of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, it talks about the fact that wisdom is described as the craftsman that was at the side of God in the beginning, whenever creation was manifest and began. And so we see, and right now I'm just talking a little bit about wisdom, and I'm just letting you know that wisdom, that, that Psalm chapter one is a wisdom, uh, is a wisdom psalm. And one of the things about the word wisdom in and of itself was that, uh, and I think I'm just going to write this word on the board because. It's something new and you may not be familiar with it. I still remember. It's funny how your memory works. I still remember the first time I saw this word. It was like probably four years ago. I remember the exact night and I remember the Bible, the study Bible that I was studying in. You remember right before we left uh, that old, the old <coughs> church area where Crossing Place is now when we were having Bible study over there and we moved to Glorious Place and we started John chapter 1. It was the first class when we started John, that whole teaching we did for about a year and a half. And I can remember it was in my archaeology Bible and when I turned to John chapter 1, this word was introduced. And the idea behind this word is that there's a close connection to the Greek word right here, logos. Y'all ought to be a little bit more familiar with that particular word. But this word here, memra, is a, is a Hebrew concept. And so it's an Old Testament Hebrew concept that's very closely related to the Greek idea of logos. So well, what does all that mean? Well, the word logos in John chapter 1, when John writes, because you gotta, you got to understand that uh, when John writes chapter 1 of John and he describes in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was the logos. The logos was with God. The logos was God. The logos became flesh. What he described there was that the word wasn't just words that were spoken, but that the word was the essence of God himself. That's the idea of Mimra in the Old Testament or the Hebrew. Even before there was ever a manifestation in the flesh of the Christ Jesus, the idea of in the Old Testament was that the word of God was literally God. It was the essence of God himself. And so when we think of the word wisdom, 
and we see how wisdom is personified in the Old Testament, it's not just words from God, but it's literally the presence of God. It's the person of God. God and his word are one. The only way you're going to get to know God is to get to know Christ. And the only way you're going to get to know Christ is to get to know his word. Amen. And that's a big part of wisdom and the wisdom of God. If you're going to walk in the wisdom of God, you're going to have to know the word of God. You're going to have to know uh, the, the wisdom of God, you're going to have to know God himself, right? And so uh, God's wisdom, Mimra, is, in, is once again a form of God's presence. But what if you looked up the word wisdom itself? Now, whenever you look up words, I was talking to Troy about this yesterday. We had a little conversation. But when you look up words in the, bio, uh, in the dictionary, uh, you know, the Strong's Greek Dictionary, all right? Or the, the Hebrew Greek Dictionary. Um, like most dictionaries... They will utilize that, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's kind of like out of nowhere, but anyway. Um, whenever you look up words in the dictionary, many times the way that the words are described or defined is that multiple synonyms are used to describe that word. You know what I'm talking about? Well, when I looked up this word wisdom in the Hebrew dictionary, it didn't even use synonyms. I thought it was kind of funny. I kind of highlighted it. You can't see it in my phone, but eight times... The word wisdom or wise or wisely was used. So they're using the same word to describe the word. But there was one word that kept showing up that seemed like it was must have been trying to capture the essence of it. That word was skill. So wisdom is not only God himself regarding, at least in the Bible, the God's manifestation of himself, God's word, God's wisdom is who he is. Because his wisdom, his word is his character. It's who he really is. Amen. And it reveals himself. But not only that, whenever the, whenever the revelation of God through his word is given to man, it creates skill in him. Now, the very definition of skill is that through knowledge and practice, a person begins to do something well. And one of the things I was thinking of, it's not like the wisdom of being a hunter or a fisherman, because you can be, you can through knowledge and practice do well at fishing and hunting. Not me, but I know people that do. I did enough time with my brother-in-law as a crawl fisherman, I was his baiter, uh, to learn some things that you have to be aware of the current and the way that the current is running whenever you're catching crawfish. It's a huge part of it. If you put your traps in the wrong spot and you don't know anything about the current, the crawfish are never even going to find your trap, right? And, and, and the same thing in hunting, uh, if you're downwind of a sit, from what I've been told, then the deer is going to smell you and you're not going to get your kill, right? Uh, the same in golf. Not that I can play golf. Don't even want to play. Try it before, done. I'm done with that. But what I will say is that a good golfer needs to know the strength and the direction that the wind's blowing. At least it helps him to understand when he hits the ball, is going to go in a certain That doesn't have anything to do with the wisdom of God. The, but what we're talking about, we're not talking about skill in playing a game. We're not talking about skill in hunting and fisher, fishing. We're talking about skill in living upon this earth with the wisdom of God and how to navigate this journey, amen, with God's will in mind and helping us to make decisions on a daily basis through the knowledge of God's word and the practice of that knowledge. See, wisdom isn't just knowledge because you can have all the knowledge in the world. You can have the, you can know the wisdom of Proverbs where it says that a soft answer turns away wrath. Right? How many times have you heard that? How many times have you read that? Yet how many times have you been in a situation, in a circumstance where somebody said the wrong thing with the wrong look on their face and your response wasn't calm humility, but instead you came back with wrath and it just caused an explosion in the situation and anger rose up and it turned into a big old mess. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I've been there before and probably not even that long ago, right? And so that's one of the things having to do with wisdom. It's just not the knowledge of something, but it's the ability to be able to apply it through knowledge and practice. You find yourself in a situation, in a circumstance, and you know, the Holy Spirit says, you've been here before, you know how to handle this. And I'll tell you, it's a good feeling. It's a good place to be yes. whenever we do yield to the Spirit Amen. and we allow wisdom to have its way in that particular circumstance, right? So we're talking about being able to do something well, and more specifically, we're talking about being able to live life on this earth in a way that's pleasing to God. So throughout Psalm 1, one other thing that I found real quick was that to me, and I'm not making a big deal about this, but I did find it interesting, is that there is imagery, in my opinion, that brings us back to the original state of creation, or at least 
in some way it alludes to it. What, what do you mean? Well, it talks about the fact of walking. It says that the, that the godly person doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but that instead what he does is, is that he meditates on the word of the Lord. Well, we get an image right there of in the beginning of, of man walking with God. There was a time frame whenever man did what wasn't going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly because there was no counsel of the ungodly to walk with except for the serpent when he showed up in the, in, in the garden. And so man in the beginning was walking in the presence and in the counsel of God. But not only that, there's also imagery of trees being planted by water, right, and rivers, and we see all of that taking place in the garden incident. Why did I even bring that up? Because Memra, wisdom, represents really the presence of God. Once again, we're reminded of how God desires to be with his creation. Plus, we have this imagery bringing us back to the garden when there was a time of the age of innocence. There was a time whenever God was closely walking with his people. And wisdom, the wisdom of God is going to help us today to get closer Amen to the presence of God. So with reference to this psalm as wisdom literature and the fact that it repeats imagery that brings us back, once again, it's just going to remind us that God wants to give us the tools we need to be able to live well with God on this earth. Three things that I noticed in the psalm itself that stuck out to me had to do with direction, nourishment, and stability. Number one, direction. We go back to Psalm 1-1. Actually, we're going to look at Psalm 1-1 and Psalm 1-2 real quick. It says, <clears throat> Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful. Verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. So, as you can see, if you go back, well, really with this conjunction right here, but, I mean, I'm sorry, I told you to go back, but... With this conjunction, but it's telling us that there's a contrast between the two verses. The first verse is saying what the, what the godly don't do. What they don't do is they don't receive counsel from the ungodly. But what they do do is that they meditate on the law of God. And so, or they actually, they delight in meditating yes. in the law of God. So counsel really describes advice. I mean, it's a simple concept, right? Delight is really the word means pleasure, to receive pleasure from the law of God. Now, we've talked about this many times in the past, but for the Old Testament Jew, the law is essentially the same for us to, to determine the, the, the whole word of God. For the Jew, the law was God's word to them. For the, for, the new, for the Christian, the New Testament believer, it's the entirety of God's word. The law is the word. And so for the, for, the, for the believer, it's the word of God that he takes delight in to meditate upon, to receive counsel from God, receiving wisdom from God. And from this, these two passages of Scripture, we see that, that there's at least two different pathways that people can try to receive wisdom as they live life out. One, they can receive it from the ungodly, or two, they can receive it from the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Um, I really, I like that, you know, Paul, this is one of Paul's writings. Well, I love the Apostle Paul, and I mean, if you've studied with us through the years, we've tried to learn a lot about his ministry and his missionary journeys and the things that he came up against. Um, he, was, he was a... Uh, he was a Jewish person that was very intellectual and he and he was able to discuss the concept of God on an intellectual level with intellectual people. And so he he brought it to a whole nother level uh, as far as for the understanding of God. But in first Corinthians chapter three, verses 18 through 20, Paul says, let no man deceive himself or the Holy Spirit through Paul says, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. So what Paul is saying is, is that there's a lot of people that are searching after human wisdom, searching after the wisdom that the world offers. But Paul's recommendation is, is that if you're striving to receive human wisdom, what I'm really here to tell you is, is that you need to let yourself become a fool in that area. And he's going to go on to say, because that, that, so that you might be wise. If you really want to be wise... You need to consider human wisdom foolishness. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. 
God doesn't see the wisdom of this world as being wise, but instead he sees it as being foolish. Sometimes that's a hard thing for us to wrap our minds around. Some, that's why so oftentimes things can be so deceptive in the world that we live in. Whenever we look at, I mean, I use this as an example. I use it a lot, but it's, it's a perfect example to give you imagery. If you go home today, you make, make it out of here early enough, you flip through the channels on Christian TV, what you may see is churches filled to the gills with people. And also, not only that, I mean, I'm just using this as an example, but, you know, some chandeliers and some fancy ornate golden chairs. And from the outside looking in, it's like, surely they're doing something right. I don't know about you, but I've had conversations with a lot of people that have been going to church for a long time. And they, they may may I've heard multiple conversations and comments that have said, hey, he's got 25,000 people going to his church. He must be doing something right. Well, hold on a second. In whose eyes? According to the wisdom of the world, he might be doing something right. According to the wisdom of what man perceives, he might be doing something right. Because man, especially in America and capitalism, perceives success as though he must be doing something right. They look at success. We look at success as numbers. But the reality of it is, is that that's not God, how God's looking at it. And I know I keep beating you down with these repetitive kind of concepts. But we got to remind ourselves that just the way that Jesus showed up proves to us that God's thinking is completely contrary to the way that the world thinks. He was the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, born in a manger amongst stinky animals, right? And when he came into town to present himself as the King of the Jews, he rode on a lowly donkey. And God had pre-planned that 600 years in advance through the prophet Zechariah. And so we see that God's mind and the way that God sees things is completely contrary to the way that we would expect. And unfortunately, the church, the modern church, has been duped into thinking that that is the wisdom of God. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. Maybe somebody's going to watch the video. And if they do, I will honestly want to say that I'm not saying this for any reason to hurt anybody's feelings or to come against anybody. But I had a conversation with somebody that I used to rub shoulders with. And one of the things that they told me was, was that at, they're going to school. And at the school that they're going to, one of the things that they learned in a class about church planting was this one guy taught on building your dream team. How you're going to find the right person to fit into the right spot. And, I, and one of the things that I had in this conversation was I said, you know, I know that the Lord has definitely softened me in some areas. He's definitely knocked some rough edges off of me. But one of the things that I used to have a problem with or that I got myself in quote unquote trouble with in the past had to do with a what I would call a contending or a defense for the gospel. Now, I've had preachers tell me before, you don't have to defend the gospel. I don't have to defend the gospel. The gospel defends itself. That's not what the apostle Paul said. Paul said, I contend for the gospel. Why? Because there's false teachers, false doctrine, a lying devil that tries to infiltrate the church then and still does today. And therefore, the gospel must be contended for. It must be defended for. And while we're over here worried about the dream team, then, then what we need to be worried about is leaders is making sure that we're understanding the gospel for the way that it's written and that we're communicating that truth to the people so that they can learn to have a relationship with God for themselves. Amen. But that's the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world begins to run the church like a CEO would run a financial corporation. That's what, it, that's what they do. They're, I'm telling you, I know it is. I'm not just making something up. I've seen it with my own eyes. They make resumes and they send their resumes out to try to better their position like some high, corp, high dollar corporate attorney or some CEO of a corporation. And it's the wisdom of the world and it's techniques of the world. And the focal point now in theological schools is how we're going to build the dream team, how we're going to build the facility, how we're going to build the structure, not let's get back to the scripture and make sure that we're getting the essence of God's word, the wisdom of God's word, amen, and to communicate it to the people so that the people can learn the word of God. So discipleship in the modern church is we're going to get into a bunch of little small groups. We might even go to people's houses and have these little off-site groups. And we're going to get this Beth Moore book. Yeah, I mentioned her name. Beth Moore book. And we're going to all study Beth Moore's teachings. My concept of discipleship is not that. That we're going to know. My concept of not saying that we can't get into smaller groups. I don't have a problem with that. Not saying that we can't go to other people's houses and open up the word of God and break bread. Don't have any problem with that. That's how the early church started. Yes. I'm not foolish enough to not know that. 
My point is, is that discipleship is, means to be a learner of Christ. Yes. In order to be a learner of Christ, you're going to have to learn who Mimra is. You're going to have to learn who the Logos is. That means you're going to have to actually dig into the word of God. That means you're going to have to learn the gospel. Amen. That means that you're going to have to do some work your own self as the people of God. That means you're going to actually have to crack open your Bible and read right. it Amen. in order to understand the word of God. That means the preacher can't be worried to tell you that from the pulpit that he might hurt your feelings and offend you. So that you can go find another church somewhere down the road where they're going to be a little bit nicer to you about it and say, well, we don't have to get that deep into the scriptures. I'll just give you what it is that I think you need. No, that's not how it works. Amen. God wants his people fed. Amen. Yeah. God wants his people to know who he is so that they can understand him. Amen. Amen. And so Paul's address to Corinth shows this thought about human wisdom and the difference between God's wisdom and the world's wisdom. Corinth was a... Not an island, but it was connected by an isthmus, a little piece of land to, that was a little bit south of Greece. And Greece was the birthplace of philosophy and human wisdom, a place that housed the epitome of human wisdom. But Paul warns that this type of wisdom uh, must not be embraced. The world has its own wisdom and compass for the direction that you should go. Let's go back and look at verse 19 on there. Two concepts I want to show you that Paul talks about when it comes to the world's wisdom out of verse 19 of where we were. What was it? First Corinthians chapter three. And we'll look at verse 19. Paul says, for the wisdom of this world is first. It's foolishness with God. <laughs> the wisdom of the world is complete foolishness with God. Number two, look at this. For it is written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness. You know what the idea there is? God didn't set a trap with this. God set a trap for mankind. Um, that's what it said. He takes the wise in their own craftiness. The, the idea here is that he baited them and he created a trap that's going to trap the, wise, the man of wisdom who thinks that he's going to operate in human wisdom. And, I, and because of their own mindset and them talking themselves into a certain pathway and way to travel, they're going to catch themselves in a trap. So the first two things about worldly wisdom is that number one, it's foolish. And number two, it's a trap. God has deemed it so. He has created it to be that way. It's not that God's wanting to go around trapping people. I'm going to get into that a little bit more here in a second. But it also, look, if you look at verse 20, human wisdom, the word of God says, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. When he's talking about human, human people that think they're wise in the ways of the world. Ultimately, the word vain there means empty. It leads to emptiness. It's not going to bring any type of fulfillment. The wisdom of humanity leads to emptiness. Now, let's take a look at God's wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 24. The opposite. God's wisdom to the world looks like complete foolishness. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. People that are dying, dead, separated from God, when they hear the word of the cross, and that's what the word preaching there is again, it's logos. So it's not only just that can it be a person, but it's also a communication, it's a message. The message of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now you can stop right there. I mean, that, that's a whole mouthful right there. But, but what I am saying is this, is that what more do you need to hear? That the message of the cross is the power of God. God operates through his power through the message of the cross. What does that even mean? Well, we say it multiple times and I'll say it one more time. The simplest version is this. God had a plan. He ultimately went through the whole process of creating a nation out of that one man named Abraham. If you think about it in human terms, there's a lot of work that went into this, a lot of planning that went into this, a lot of orchestration. God created a nation out of one man for one purpose to give us the man Christ Jesus, the righteous one born of incorruptible seed that would offer up his, his sinlessness upon a cross to pay the penalty for sinful man. And faith in that allows an exchange to take place where the Christ took my sin upon him and he exchanged to me his righteousness as a gift. And because of that righteousness gift that I've now received, I have access into the presence of God. I have access to the grace of God. And now the grace of God doesn't just mean, oops, I did it again, get to clean up my mess. No, it means power from God. 
And the power from God gives me the strength that I need in order to stand. That's all scripture. That's all Bible. That's all Bible verse. That's the message of the cross. That God has a plan. And that has been communicated and orchestrated through thousands of years of human history. It's not just one event. Yes, it climaxed in that event called the crucifixion. But it's not even just the physical nature of what we see there when we see it on the passion of the Christ. It's the spiritual power, the spiritual victory that was, re that was effected in the spiritual realm when Jesus died and paid the penalty for sin. And broke the back of sin and took away the, the force of the enemy in your life. It's a spiritual miracle that took place. This is the wisdom of God. Yes. Far beyond man's comprehension. You can't even, of course you don't understand it. People say, I can't even understand the preacher. Sometimes people say that about my preaching. Look good. You, you, we're not going to understand it, especially not on the front end. It's the word of God. It's another language. It came from another realm, another kingdom. We've been oblivious to it. We've been clueless to it. We've grown up all of our lives since we were in diapers listening to mommy and daddy's wisdom. And even if they had a little bit of the wisdom of God that they were trying to pour into us, it was all discombobulated. It was all jumbled up with all the other things that they learned. Yeah. It's going to take time. It's a process of time for us to learn the word of God, for us to learn the wisdom of God, for us to learn the ways of God, because it's foolishness to me. It doesn't make any sense. It's completely contrary to everything that we've ever known. He says, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe that's like an intelligent scholar? Where is the disputer of this world that's like a philosopher in Greece? Where, where is the of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. So in other words, they tried with all their wisdom to find God. But with all their human wisdom, they couldn't find God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It's just like God. You remember earlier how I said he catches them in their craftiness. He set a trap. It, it's like he made the gospel to the wise of the world seem so foolish that they, they're never going to be able to see it. With, with human eyes. Yeah. The foolishness of preaching a message that tells a story about some Jewish person that was born of a carpenter. Well, you know, they think he was born of a carpenter and supposedly born of a virgin. I, I, when I say, I'm not being irreverent. I'm trying to say what the world sees. And that somehow this baby would grow up to a man and die on two pieces of wood and that salvation can take place in the foolishness to the man to the mind of man foolishness to human things sounds like the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus at least that's what one dude told me on the street when I tried to witness to him about Jesus and and the reality of it is is that people miss it because they're thinking in their own intellect you ever try to talk to a smart person about Jesus before I love talking to smart people about Jesus, but I think I'd tell you that sometimes it can be very frustrating, very irritating. But sometimes, because I've done it enough times, the Lord gives me some little zingers for them. I can see their little wheels turning, and I, that's why I enjoy it. But, but in the end, I'm oftentimes left very frustrated because it, yeah. you didn't really get anywhere with it. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. We're talking about wisdom this morning. We're talking about the fact that the godly don't sit in the counsel of the ungodly to receive ungodly worldly wisdom. But that instead they meditate on the law of God. It's a pleasure to them to receive their wisdom from God's word. The word, the world, I'm sorry, can't find truth or direction through human wisdom. They can't find the truth of God through human wisdom. And I was thinking when I looked at this this morning, this little statement, I kind of added this to my notes. A tree to be desired to make one wise. I thought of that, how that's how the serpent approached Eve. This, whenever he said you can eat from it, whenever she saw that the tree was one to be desired to make one wise. This is, this is the whole problem. 
The whole problem with human wisdom, the whole problem with ungodly counsel, is that it's built upon something that doesn't come from above. It's built upon something that is demonic. As a matter of fact, if we go to James chapter 3, verses 10 through 17, <clears throat> it says, um, first off, it's talking about the mouth here, it's talking about the tongue. And, you know, James talks about the fact that the tongue is an unruly member. That, it, that it's hard to control, hard to tame. He says you can, you can steer a big old ship with a little rudder. You can steer a big old powerful horse with a bit in its mouth. But when it comes to the tongue, man seems to be incapable of controlling this member that can kindle a forest fire. He says, he, he says out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? It's talking about salt water or fresh water. Whenever you see a fountain, does it spew out both at the same time? No, it's one or the other. So why does the mouth, in one hand, bless God, and out of the other, curses man? He says, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries or either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation or lifestyle his works with meekness of wisdom. That's one thing that you'll see about the wisdom of God is that it ultimately has meekness connected to it. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Now, the main point I wanted to make with this passage of Scripture was to show you where human wisdom comes from. Because he said it, this kind of wisdom is earthly, it's sensual, it's devilish, it come, it's demonic. Human wisdom is not the spirit that's driving it, is not the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from above. It's part of this fallen aspect of the human realm that we live in. He says, but if you have, uh, let's see here. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Ultimately, the wisdom of God is going to lead people in a direction and it's going to have the right motives behind it. I mean, I can tell sometimes when, when, my, when, when I'm trying to counsel with somebody or talk to somebody, I can tell whatever Matt's, Matt's stuff wants to get in the way. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I'll even admit it on the phone. I'm just telling you right now, my heart ain't right on this. So I may not be the best person for you to listen to in this situation. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's not that difficult whenever we understand what the word of God sounds like. And, and we see where our own wisdom tries to infiltrate the situation. We got to be we got to be careful of that kind of thing. We have to be careful that we don't let our wisdom or the world's wisdom get in the way of God's. Amen. The world definitely can't find God through human wisdom. Therefore, once again, God set a trap for men to get caught in their own wisdom. He who attempts to walk closer to the human wisdom is just going to find himself walking further and further away from God further and further away from the salvation that God offers. There's another thought in these two verses. Remember, we started off where we were compare, contrasting verse 1 with verse 2, where it says that, the, that, the, that uh, the godly man doesn't sit under the counsel of the ungodly, but instead he delights in the law of the Lord. But in verse 1 again, it says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. One of the things that I wanted you to see there is there's a progression that's taking place. A progression that's taking place with the connection to the ungodly. First, they're sitting with them, walking with them. Next, they're, sitting, they're, they're standing with them. Next, they're sitting with them. This is essentially what Lot did. Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. Next thing you know, Lot's living in Sodom. Next thing you know, Lot's sitting down in Sodom conducting business with the leadership of Sodom. And so that's what's happening is, is it has to do with the company that we keep. 
I wish that there was more people in here this morning that could hear that kind of thing. We have to be careful as the people of God that have called to be separated from the world to be aware of the company that we keep. We spend enough time around the world listening to their viewpoints, listening to their way, whether we listen to it through Hollywood, listen to me, that's what goes back to the whole music thing. I know that I, every now and then I just throw this stuff out there. The reason why is, once again, when I first got saved, they told me, well, you shouldn't listen to worldly music, but nobody really explained to me why. I'm telling you that when we hear the message of Hollywood enough or the message of their music enough, it begins to influence us with their type of wisdom. They have a certain way of seeing life. They have a certain way of seeing the direction that people should go. And they're constantly feeding that communication. It's the opposite of God's way. It's the opposite of God's plan. And so when we find ourselves in close connection to the world like Lot did, he ended up losing everything that was ever important to him. He lost everything that was important. The wisdom of the world will leave you empty. Sometimes it will leave you empty financially. Sometimes it will leave you empty emotionally. But it will always leave you empty spiritually. God's wisdom, while it seems foolish to the world, teaches us how to be connected to him through faith in Jesus. And this in turn gives us access to his grace and strength and direction. You know, that's one of the things about the wisdom of God that's a difficult thing to kind of wrap your mind around. Because it's not, you're not going to just gain wisdom. And believe me, I've tried. I, I, I think to some extent my heart was right. But God can't honor flesh in any way. And so I can remember as a young Christian, you know, I would bring my Bible offshore. And I, I didn't have a whole lot of boldness from the Lord. But I guess because of the way my personality was, I was determined. I knew I was saved. I knew God had changed me. I knew that the world didn't like the Jesus that I embraced. So I'd bring that Bible out there offshore and I'd be up there in my bunk and I'd read it to where they could see it. And it caused a lot of conversation, <clears throat> but I really didn't know what I was reading. I tried. I, tr I tried to read it time and again. And the point that I'm trying to make right now is you're not going to truly gain the wisdom of God just through the rote reading of it. However, I'll say this. If you never open it up and read it, you'll definitely never find the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is like the person of God. And when you're embracing this, you're <laughs> delighting in it. Part of what I was doing was there was a part to me that wanted to delight in it and say, I'm a Christian now. And, and so I want to know God. But part of me also had been trained to think that this is what Christians do. Get in there and just read your word. Right. And, 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 and I had turned it into something that it was never intended to be. And whenever you do that, you end up frustrating the grace of God in the long run. I'm not saying nothing good never came out of it. But what I'm trying to say is, is that wisdom is going to be a process of time. And if you don't start today, you're never going to get started. Wisdom is a process of time where you read the word of God with the right motives because you delight in the word of God. You delight in God's uh, instruction. You delight in God's wisdom. You delight in the Lord. You want to know his will and his way. So therefore, you get into his law. You get into his word and you allow it to speak to you. Then as time goes by and that, that information, that godly information that's completely contrary to the world system gets into your spirit, man, you begin to see things a little bit differently. Amen. It starts to happen. You start to be able to see things more clearly the way that God sees them instead of the yes. way that the world has been instructing you to see them. Then the next thing you know, you start handling your situations differently. You start handling your circumstance. The ungodly man might counsel you to handle a situation this way. But the Lord is trying to counsel you to handle a situation a different way. I, I keep going back to, to the fact that when I almost took a, a job a long time ago, and I won't get into all the, all the detail. I'll try to make it as fast as possible. But I can just remember that somebody offered me a job, and they were going to pay me $10,000 more a year. And whenever I talked to the spiritual people that I knew around me, one was a preacher, one was another person that I respected. They were like, dude, it's a no-brainer, 10000 more a year. Um, but I had a very uneasiness in my spirit about it. One thing after the other. And I was just forging forward, okay? I'm, I've received godly counsel. And I'm not saying that they weren't godly men, but I've received godly counsel. I was just moving forward with it the whole time. God's trying to say to me, this isn't, this isn't my will. Make a long story short, thank God it didn't happen. I kept my same job. It's a long story how it happened, a very humbling experience. I kept my same job. A year later, that clinic closed down. 
that one that they were going to give me the job in. And I'm not even going to sit here and tell you how many raises I've gotten since then that so far surpassed the $10,000 that they were going to give me. The point is not about how much God gave me. Then that, that was just the beginning because then the ministry exploded on the job. That, you know, God had it all orchestrated and all planned, and yet it defied the logic of even people that loved God. It, they, it was so far away from what they could have seen. You see, and that's what I'm trying to say is, is that in order to know God's wisdom, you got to know memory. You got to know logos. You got to know God. And in order for you and I to be able to receive that, it's a process of time where I was even sharing. I think it was with Troy or somebody. It might have been that other guy that's sitting on the side of me that true Christianity has to do with teaching people to allow Jesus to be their pastor. Yes. Amen. 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 I mean, really. You know, I mean, okay, sure. I was telling somebody, yeah, don't get me wrong. The phone is usually on, not all the time, but usually on. I mean, I was able to, re to receive a phone call yesterday and pray with somebody. But in reality, what that person needs more than they need me. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I want to be here for you. And mo most people that have ever desired to talk to me know that I make myself available. But, but the reality is, is that what you really need is the Lord. Amen. What you really need from the preacher is to learn the scriptures and to communicate the scriptures to you in such a way that you can learn memory, you can learn Lagos, you can learn Jesus, you can have access to the Father through him, and that you can receive through the Holy Spirit the right direction to go and not be hard-headed like Matt and keep saying, oh, I'm going to take that $10,000 more a year job. That was worldly wisdom. That was trying to make Matt move to what, what, $10,000. I mean, when it was all said and done, it was probably going to cost me more because I had to pay for my insurance. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, that's another story. That's for another time. Number one, God wants to give us direction. Number two, nourishment. Let's look at Psalm chapter one, verses two through three. But, in his, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in the season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. To be honest with you, number two and number three kind of are interconnected. And because number three, if I'm not mistaken, I said was stability. And you see at the end of verse three right here how it talks about bringing forth fruit in due season, how the leaf doesn't wither, and that whatever he does shall prosper. All of these really, even the concept of the tree, are signs of or images of stability. A tree is something that stands. What you see on the outward is you see strength, you see longevity. Typically, trees describe longevity. They've been there for a while. We've seen these majestic oaks. We've got those in, in Louisiana. They're over 100 years old. You know, some of these oak trees, they've been around a long time. They've been around longer than us. And so that's one of the pictures that we see, a picture of strength and stability. It's not something that is easily moved. Furthermore, this tree is spoken of with reference to water. It's close proximity to water. What does that mean? It's close to the water. This tree is close to water. The most important part of a tree, and we've talked about this before, is its hidden root system. You see on the outside stability and strength. It looks like something that's been there for a long time, but it's the root system of a tree, right? right that gives it access to the water that's nearby. And, and so it's no different for the believer. He is likened to a tree, and a spiritual tree needs spiritual roots. Can you go to Ephesians chapter 3, verses uh, 14 through 17. Ephesians 3, verse 14. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's getting on his knees in prayer for the Ephesian church, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. He's God our Father, right? That we, he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now, stay right there for a second. So what Paul's prayer for Ephesus is that he would grant to them according to the riches of his glory that they would be strengthened. Where? With might by his spirit in the inner man. That they would be strengthened spiritually by the spirit of God. Right? Alright, go to the next verse. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, 
may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. In order to be able to be strengthened internally in the inner man by the Spirit of God, one must be rooted and grounded in the love of God. Now, in order to be rooted and grounded in the love of God, this is not just talking about some superficial knowledge about the things of God. But instead, it's talking about a deeper understanding and, and, and maybe not even un, so much an intellectual understanding, but a familiarity. Does that make sense what I'm saying? We familiarized ourselves with the word of God. We familiarized ourselves with the ways of God. Not, not, not necessarily being able to spout off all the Greek words and all that. Yeah, it all has to do with the context. But the, it, this is more of familiar to understand the depth, the length, the height of his love. The love of God is manifest in what he did through Jesus. All of this goes back to Calvary. All of this goes back to the plan of God. And I just wanted you to see that rooted and grounded. If you go to Colossians chapter 2. Verse 6. It says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Verse 7. Rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So the same way you received Him, we've talked about this verse before many times. How did you receive Him? Through faith. Through faith. Through faith in what? Through faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Is the same way you walk in Him. As you keep your faith in Christ and what He did for you at the cross, you maintain your righteous position before the eyes of God. You receive grace. In this process, as you do that, you become rooted and built up in Him. You become established in the faith. Amen? Our root system is extremely important. We're seeing the image of a tree that is planted by the water. We're talking about nourishment. Our root system allows us to tap into the water which is nearby, which represents the Spirit of God. In the first passage of Scripture that we looked at right there earlier in Ephesians, Paul's prayer for, for the, Ephes the Ephesian church was that they would be strengthened in their inner man by the Spirit of God. The tree represents the believer. The water represents the Holy Spirit. The root system allows the connection connection to take place between the two and the imagery is once again one of nourishment strength and stability and the thought of water is used in various ways but specifically definitely has to do with the spirit of God people are thirsty Amen. you know there's no have you ever seen somebody dehydrated before I'm not talking about the little bit of dehydration that you might have felt a few times I mean have you ever really been dehydrated I mean it is a mess to see dehydration I mean the weakness that's caused whenever you're dehydrated. You can't do anything. Right? And, and, and if you think of that spiritually, there's no... A spiritual dehydration causes extreme weakness. But God is offering people to be hydrated. Just like that tree that's planted by the water shall not be moved. John chapter 7 verses 37 through 39 talks about this feast where Jesus was and it says in the last day of that great day of the feast Jesus stood and cried saying if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink now <clears throat> I've read this before and uh, studied behind it and what they would do is is that this feast lasted seven days from what I remember shoot from the hip and the priest would take a a, jug, a bucket of water, a pitcher of water, and they'd go to the pool, they'd come back up on the steps where Jesus was, and they'd pour one pitcher down, and on the last day, they would do it seven times. They would get seven pitchers of water, they'd pour it up on the steps, and so as Jesus is saying this, these priests are pouring this water, and it's flowing down the steps, and Jesus begins to say this. He said, he cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus was talking about the fact that he was going to go to the cross. When he went to the cross and people put faith in him that the Holy Spirit was going to come to live in them. And that it was going to be like living waters that were going to bubble out of them. Spiritual nourishment, a root system that connects Amen. The believer to the very spirit of God through Jesus Christ. We're coming right back 
to the truth that to be rooted and grounded in the faith means to properly understand what the faith even is, means to properly understand what God's salvation history plan is, means to properly know where to keep your faith, which is in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, going back again repetitively saying it, because why? Because God had a plan for guilty man. And he went through the whole process of calling one man named Abraham out to create a nation who through that nation could give us the righteous one who through him dying on the cross and our faith in that the exchange takes place. We receive his righteousness. He receives our guilt. Now we have access to grace and like living water from the Holy Spirit nourishing us, strengthening us on the inside. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. It's not a human wisdom. You're not going to figure it out on your own. Amen. It's walking with the Lord, yes. being in relationship, rooted and grounded in the faith, being in relationship with God on a daily basis. Yes. God speaking to you, encouraging you and strengthening you. In first Corinthians 10, four, it says, talking about the children of Israel, the apostle Paul reminiscing back about the children of Israel says, <laughs> and did all drink. They all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock. That followed them and that rock was Christ. So the Apostle Paul says, remember that rock in the Old Testament? The one that Moses spoke to and then he hit and water flowed out of it? Paul, the Apostle Paul says, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. He's the only one that can quench the thirst. That's a, that was a physical manifestation of a future spiritual truth. Amen. That when you put your faith in that, you're going to be hydrated by the presence of God. God's going to take care of you. Number three. Stability. We talked about direction. We talked about uh, nutrition, nourishment, and now we're talking about stability. The word, the, the, the word stability simply means firmness in position, continuance without change, permanence. Like that tree looks permanent, right? That's the last part we're going to talk about. Because it said in that last part of that verse that your leaf will never wither. It's going to bring forth fruit in its due season, right? But here in the end, it says the ungodly are not so. In contradistinction or in contrast to a withered leaf and a tree that brings forth fruit, the ungodly aren't like that. Instead, they're like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Doesn't mean they're not going to be there. It means they're going to be standing. They're, they're going to be judged. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. How opposite is this picture painted by these last verses of this song? The imagery of chaff flying away in the wind is the opposite of firmness or stability. In addition, there is the inability to stand in the day of judgment. If you go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. <clears throat> When I got this picture of chaff flying in the wind, <clears throat> this verse came to me. Actually, yesterday when I was just kind of out. A lot of times after I write my message, I just kind of chew on it for a little while, like wherever I'm in. Even if, like, if we're at the restaurant or something, you kind of see me daze off for a second. <laughs> like I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of something. I'm trying to like roll it around in my brain a little bit. When I thought about the chaff at some point yesterday after I read the message, this verse came to my my mind, and I meant to go put it in my in my notes, and I forgot until this morning. I remembered it. And I went and put it in there. And it just, it reminds me, because we're talking about the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of the world. We're, we're talking about instruction from God. We're talking about the difference between stability and firmness, right? Versus flying away like chaff. And so it said right here, till we all come in the unity of the faith. So the Apostle Paul is talking to Christians. And he's saying, there's a... A road to travel till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. That's the goal. We're pr pr constantly, progressively moving towards understanding the Son of God and understanding God. Till we come to a perfect man, a one of completion. That won't happen until the day we see the Lord. But we're in a constant state of change. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Next verse. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now, the reason that I believe that this verse came to my mind had specifically to do with the fact that children being tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of doctrine. Like chaff in the wind, 
you can see, you know what chaff is, we talked about that before, it's the husk that's on the grain. You've seen that like on a peanut, outside of a peanut shell, and you roll it around in your hand, you blow it and it just flies away. Similarly, that's what happens to people, even if they be believers, but that they've been exposed to false doctrine, they've been exposed to human wisdom and an intermingling. People don't understand why the condition of the church is the way that it is, but many times it's because of this. It's not always this, but many times it's because of this. That because we don't understand Memra, we don't understand the Logos, we don't understand the Word, we don't understand the wisdom of God, and what God's plan is really communicating, we find ourselves tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine and the slight of men. You know, that word slight is, I've shared this, many of you have been here since the beginning, and you've probably heard this ten times, but for those of you that haven't, that word slight there describes the slight of, of hand. In other words, you've seen that <clears throat> people before on TV where they got their little card game, <laughs> their little uh, cup game with the key in the middle, and they're like, where is it now, where is it now? You know, and it's like you try to guess and, you, and they want to they gamble with you, and it's like, ah, you know, and it's, and, and it's like they're quick with their hands. Literally what the Apostle Paul's saying is, is that cunning craftiness that there's people then, and I believe, I'm not going to get into all that right now, but I've done the research, people today purposefully changing things, the sleight of hand, changing doctrine, causing people to be like tossed on the waves of the ocean to and fro, back and forth, like chaff blowing in the wind. And <clears throat> that's the world. That's the world's influence upon the church. That's the world's wisdom. That's what it will cause. Have you ever looked at your own life and thought, you know what, that sounds a little bit like me. Yeah. A piece of chaff flying around in the wind, tossed to and fro on, on the ocean. I know that there's been times in my life that I've been that way. <clears throat> and it's because I wasn't living according to the wisdom of God. I was living according to what Matt thought was best. And the wisdom of man will always cause you to end up like that. As we think about the world and the fact that they try so hard with their wisdom to gain direction in this world, we see where they aimlessly wander around and ultimately will end up in emptiness. That's one last point I think that I would like to make about this message this morning. Robert, you can get the communion stuff ready. But one of the, one of the last things I want to make, is, points I want to make is, is that God has allowed us to be like trees planted by the water. That's the purpose of the Christian life. An image, of, an, an image of stability, an image of firmness, right? Planted by the water to receive the nutrition of God. But this world is out there like chaff blowing around in the wind. They need to be able to see something that's firm and stable. Yeah. We don't want to make fun of them. Ah, you poor little thing. You're over there like a like a buoy being tossed to and fro on an ocean. You're like chaff in the wind. No, we want them to be able to see what firmness and stability looks like yeah. so that they would also have a desire to have a relationship, amen, with God. And so we need God to continue to strengthen us.